It's a great pleasure to be standing in front of such a full audience coming to a session about empirical evidence, given it's pretty much absent from the rest of the conference and earlier stages. It's also a delight to be here as being the head of the first Oxford Institute for Economic Modeling funded by INET, and we'll be exploring some of the ideas I'll be talking about this morning. I've come at the problem from kind of the opposite side to Lars, but I think we have the same objectives as you will see. I think the problem with a vast amount of empirical macro is it's been so excessively simplistic to try and keep in touch with simplistic theory that it hasn't told us anything about the real world. And I want to actually look at how we might examine a real world of immense complexity, many interacting effects, many structural breaks, mismeasured data, possibly nonlinear reactions by agents, and how we might do all that. Now, human beings can't do it. It's too complicated. There are too many things involved, too many possible breaks. So what I want to show you, and it comes out in the quote at the bottom, that very advanced technology that looks like magic, and I'm going to show you live some of the things we can now do. All economic theories are obviously incorrect, incomplete, and mutable. They're incomplete because they have to make strong Ketris Paris Bruce assumptions involving all sorts of things that cannot work when the world is non-stationary. It was a perfectly viable approach in a stationary world to say, let's hold this fixed. But you can't do that in a non-stationary world because it won't stay fixed. Secondly, they're incorrect because whatever economic analysis, however clever you come up with, it's of the form that y depends on x, where y might be a vector and x a vector. And the form of f depends on all sorts of unknowns about agents, their loss or utility functions, their heterogeneous choices, the different constraints they face, the information they possess. Usually there's arbitrary assumptions that the form of f based on relative risk aversion or whatever, that it's constant, that only x matters, that the x's are givens or whatever. And as all of these things are shifting over time, often abruptly, as we've just seen, the analysis has to be incorrect. Thirdly, it's mutable. Economic theory advances. It really does make significant progress, even if we have to go back to the 1930s to understand the present situation. If we look at option pricing, auctions, contracts, principal agent, game theories, trust, moral hazard, asymmetric information, institutions, all of it major impacts on how the world works and on how economics functions. Just imagine imposing 1900 economics on data today. Well, that's what they're going to think in 20 years' time when they look back at people who imposed today's theory on the evidence without letting the evidence speak for itself. They're just going to laugh. And it leads to fad cycles and fashions because the evidence gets junked when the theory gets changed as it had no independent status. Its status depended wholly and completely in believing the theory. We saw that in the 70s when Keynesian models were abandoned. All the evidence went with them because it wasn't independent evidence. Now, the data matter greatly for empirical implementation. Imagine we've got a sample of T observations, say 100, 150. Economics doesn't tell you anything about time. There's no economic theory of time, a microsecond, a nanosecond, or a million years. It all looks the same. Our observations are almost bound to be contaminated, and although I won't talk about it, exactly the same methods can be used to improve the data that we work on. The underlying process is obviously integrated, and as all of you are well aware, given the nature of this conference, abrupt shifts occur and have always occurred. They've occurred ever since humanity came along in the forms of wars, natural catastrophes, climate change, huge changes in innovation and technology and finance, etc., etc. So many features of models cannot and never will be derivable from economic theory alone. And we need empirical evidence on which variables really do matter, how they matter, what their lag responses are, what the functional forms of connections are, what the structural breaks occurred over the period, what unit routes are out there and other non-stationarities. Are they simultaneously connected? What's exogenous? How do agents' expectations get modeled in all of this? And I want to call this model discovery. We've got to find these things from the evidence because we'll never find them from the theory, however sophisticated. Why sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast, said the white queen and through the looking glass. If only it were just six. 
Here are 12 things you would need to believe the truth of some of these models. That it's correct, comprehensive, and immutable. That you've got all the relevant variables, all their lags, and they're completely covering all the possible effects. It's a valid and relevant choice of both instruments and regressors. You've got exactly the right functional form for every variable. You've got rid of all the hidden dependencies that plague cross-section and panels. All your expectations formulations are correct. All the parameters are identified. The ones you're looking at are constant, invariant to the policy change you want to investigate. You've got exact data measurements in every variable. The errors are independent and homoscedastic. Their distributions are constant over time. You've picked the appropriate estimator. And you've got a valid and non-distortionary method of model selection. So truth's not an offer. So what is? What I think is, is to retain what we understand from economic theory in the context of our models. But the models have got to be vastly larger. And I mean vastly. I'm going to show you very shortly modeling with 600 variables and 150 data points. I am going to show you modeling with 600 variables and 150 data points, doing it live and letting you see that it works. Because we've now cracked these problems. We actually have analytical theories of how you can do this and why it works. And we're going to embed the theory specification in vastly more general structures. And there are going to be four key steps. The first is due to the economist. What is the problem of interest? What's the target for modeling? What variables are going to come in? The second is going to be done by the computer. It's going to embed your target in a vastly more general structure that allows for all the things you couldn't and didn't think of and didn't know about the world. Then we're going to search for the simplest acceptable representation of that, and then we're going to evaluate it on independent evidence. So in formulating, we're going to do many candidates, long lags, nonlinearities, dealing with outliers and parameter shifts. In selection, we're going to deal with more variables and observations. We're going to deliver near unbiased estimates after the selection. And then we're going to automatically evaluate it. And we're doing this routinely now in Oxford. I'm going to show you how it works. It only appears to be magic. It really is not at all. It's just high technology. So the case in question is going to be artificial data, where we know the answer and know whether or not the program has found it or not. And that, in fact, is the answer up there on the screen. I don't know if you can read it, but it's an artificial data set that was first published in 1984, looking at consumers' expenditure as a function of lag consumers' expenditure, income, lagged income, and inflation. And it was an attempt to mimic the impact of the oil crisis on UK consumption functions shortly after the publication of quite a famous paper by Davidson et al. Now, only one lag matters. Only four variables matter, but I'm going to embed this in 650 variables and search for it. So let's clear the answer. And we're going to put in every variable that was in the original data set. Aha. OK, now I actually need a keyboard for this. There's a problem. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very tedious. Can I? Uh... No, it won't do that. Oh, dear. Um... Yes. If... Brilliant organization, but no keyboard is a slight problem. There's probably a keyboard back there, but it's going to be. Uh... So I'm putting in 20 lags of every variable. Most of these variables don't matter because they're uh, not part of the original data set. But the answer was published in 1984. So this is probably a bigger model than any of you have ever seen in your life. But just to make matters more difficult, I'm also going to put in an indicator for every observation in the data set. So it's a zero one dummy for every single observation. And that's quite important because there might be a break at any point in any form. It might be a, an outlier, it might be data contamination, a level shift, a trend shift. All of these are needed in there. Oops. So that's it searching away. OK, I missed something in what I was doing. Uh, what did I miss out at the start? Yeah, 622. Um, yes, I, I've never worked with the absence of a keyboard before. Um, it's an interesting.
My colleagues refuse to do these things live because so many things can go wrong. Um, so, you can take any like length here, providing you've got this set of variables in there, and it will find the right answers. It completely answers Keynes's rude remarks about put 70 econometricians into 70 rooms and you'll find 70 different answers. Put 1,000 econometricians into 1,000 rooms, give them this data set. If they embed the answer in a very, very general structure, they will find the answer. And we can work all that out from theory. Now, it happens that this data set, the variables that matter are huge needles. They're dead easy to find in the haystack you're looking in. But we only, quote unquote, only had about 650 variables. And that may seem an awful lot to you. What have we got here? 643 for our 139. But in fact, at a 0.1% significance level, which is a T value of about three and a half, the probability of keeping even one of those variables that didn't matter by chance is only 0.6. So it's a 60% chance you'll get exactly the right answer and a 99% chance you'll get it within one variable despite starting with so many variables. So how is this possible? Well, it's possible because we've got a complete theory of how to do econometrics, starting from the fact that the economy is very complicated, hugely high dimensional, and too non-stationary for us to get any grip on. We set up small sets of variables, money, income, prices, inflation, interest rates, etc. And we want to model those sets. And that defines the set of the x's, the variables of interest. But most people have modeled them in immensely simplistic ways in which their answers are distorted. Because if the world is non-stationary and you omit any substantive effect, your answer will be non-constant and wrong. So having got the target, you've then got to embed it in a vastly more general structure that allows for all these features of reality that we know are there, with the additional candidate variables, the lag formulation, functional forms, and so on. Then we can search for it, and I'll explain in a moment how we search, but the thing we're looking for is very different from what most economists are looking for. We're looking for what we call a congruent, parsimonious, encompassing model of the actual generation process of the set of variables you're working with. Now, you learned congruence at school. Two triangles on top of each other. If they exactly match, they're congruent. But nobody told you the bottom triangle was actually the cut-off top of a million-dimensional pyramid. And they match where they touch, and they don't match anywhere else. So it's not truth, but it is congruent. Parsimonious is obvious as small as you can get off of viable, and encompassing is the requirement that your model explains the results of everybody else's model. And if it can't do that, it is obviously not a complete picture of the underlying reality. Now, searching turns out to be the simplest part of this, and then evaluation is going to require us to look at what we call super exogeneity, which is essentially causality. Can you change X? If you do change X, does it change Y? And does it change Y without altering the parameters linking Y and X? So what's an offer is theory-guided, congruent, parsimonious, encompassing models with parameters that are invariant to the relevant policies that you want to investigate. So this is a schematic diagram. We start off with some enormously complicated mechanism. All sorts of things are happening. We've got a theory of why you always get a joint density of the variables of interest. You set up a hugely general unrestricted model, which will nest this process, because if it doesn't, you're wasting your time. You cannot find your target unless it's included in the search. Then you use an automatic algorithm to find it. Then you evaluate it against the evidence that's available. Now, this requires discovery, and discovery has always gone on in econometrics. Most of you probably went to some horrific econometrics course that said y is x beta plus epsilon, beta is constant, x is known, x is correctly measured, x is exogenous, the errors are well behaved, and we can then estimate this beta. And then you say, well, actually, that never happens. And you go to the next chapter of the book, and then they tell you how to discover whether your model's all wrong, that the betas aren't constant, the errors aren't independent, the x's aren't well measured. And you get chapter after chapter of tests to discover that you've done it all wrongly, and you wonder, why did they teach me all this stuff if it's all going to go wrong? And the same is true of non-parametric methods. They try to discover the functional form, but they assume that everything else is known and correct, the betas are, are given, the betas are constant, the x's are all correct, etc. There's no data contamination. The same with existing methods of model discovery. They assume you're looking for the best model in a set, where the set might be absolutely useless. 
There's no checking that it describes the evidence. Robust statistics, trying to find the sample that gives you the best estimates of the betas, assuming the betas are constant, the x's are known, and so on. So all of them are doing inept methods of model discovery. We want to reframe the whole process and do it all jointly and simultaneously to find the X's that matter in the giant set that capture the local data generation process, the functional forms, taking out all the breaks that are in there. And it leads to hugely general models. How can it work? How can you do this? And I want you to think of an analogy because the mathematics gets too complicated. And the analogy is very simple and very related to what you learned in Econometrics 101. Y depends on a set of Zs. The betas are fixed. The Zs are all mutually orthogonal. The errors are beautifully behaved. You've got 1,000 variables, perhaps, 2,000 observations, and you simply estimate your general model. You then rank the t-squared statistics, squaring to get rid of signs, from the largest to the smallest. And then you tell me what kind of person you are. You like t's that are bigger than 2. So c squared is 4. You like t's bigger than 3. c squared is 9. We choose c squared to try and minimize certain probabilities, but you can choose it. Then every t squared bigger than that is kept, and every one smaller is out. And despite there being a 1,000 variables, you have chosen your model in one decision. There's no repeated testing. There's no side effects. We never look at goodness of fit. None of those things come in at all. And that's the analogy, and that's what is actually happening. But we're doing past search to rank the t-squareds because economic data are not orthogonal. They're very highly intercorrelated. And you need to find out which are the actually relevant t-squareds. Now, people have confused model selection with the impossible task of saying there are two to the n possible models and let's find the best of them. And that cannot be done. There's no method in the planet can control what's happening. Nevertheless, selection matters. Because because of sampling, this guy might have been on the other side, and this one might have been, and even further along uh, around the region. But also, you're only keeping things that are highly significant. So they must be biased away from the origin. But Jim Heckman got the Nobel Prize for showing how you fix that. Because we're dealing with all the problems, we get near normality, so we can use the corrections to the normal distribution to unbias the estimates after we've done them. So despite selecting from 1,000 variables when only, say, 10 are relevant, this method shows you get nearly unbiased estimates, same for the goodness of fit, almost no loss of efficiency. I'll come back to that in a second. Some loss from not retaining relevant variables because you have to use tighter significance levels than the conventional 5%. A gigantic gain from not using underspecified non-constant models, and it works even if there are fat-tailed distributions. So how do we know it works? Well, in work with Soren Johansson and a student, Carlos Santos, we've investigated this case of putting in a dummy variable for every observation, an indicator. And you can imagine it as follows. You don't know where the breaks are. You don't know where the data contamination occurs. So you create a set of 100 dummies for 100 observations. You put in the first 50. You examine which ones matter. You keep a record of which ones do. You drop them. You put in the second 50. You examine which of those matter. You drop them. Then you combine the two sets and select the ones that matter. Now, many of you have done things like this quite regularly. If you've ever done a chow test, you've done a version of this. If you've ever done recursive estimation, you've done a version of this. If you've ever done moving windows, you've done a version of this. All inefficient and uncontrolled versions. This is completely controlled because at a significance level alpha, when none of the dummies matter, you will just keep alpha t of them. So if alpha is 1 up in t, you'll keep one dummy by chance. What does an indicator do? It eliminates one observation. So from the 100 observations, you're left using 99. This method is 99% efficient under the null, despite including more variables and observations. And that goes through in general. So Soren worked with a colleague, Bent Nielsen. We extended this to general stationary and non-stationary autoregressions with other variables involved. And they've shown that the usual convergence route applies, root t. It's the correct parameter. It's normally distributed. It's the right variance covariance matrix. But there is a correction factor, which depends on the efficiency, which can be kept at 99 or 99.9% .9 efficient. So despite an enormous amount of selection, it costs you nothing to do it absolutely nothing to do it. But if you didn't do it and there was a break, you would end up with rubbish. So here's an example of this happening. Structural break, the data's white noise, there's a 10 standard deviation shift at observation 75, 
And as many people have remarked, many investigators today never look at the data. So if they simply fitted the mean and looked for outliers, there isn't a single outlier, despite a 10 standard deviation shift in the mean. All the residuals from fitting the mean are within two standard errors. So stepwise regression and similar procedures, outlier detection, have absolutely no power. What does Artometrics do in this setting? Well, let's repeat it. Clear this, change the data set. Now we want no lags. Uh, ah, now how do you delete? Uh, you don't delete without a keyboard either, do you? Uh, Oh, the trials and tribulations of the modern e econometrician. Um, I think Gilbert and Sullivan actually wrote an opera about it, and you can do a new one. So here's what econometrics. And I'll just show you the graph, and you can see what's happened. It immediately picks up the break. It's not a very difficult break to pick up, and it jumps down. And the cost of having done these 100 dummies for the 100 observations, if there had been no break, is 1%. If there had been a break, you're in deep trouble by not picking it up. How did it work? Well, it works because, as I say, it puts in half the dummies. Half the dummies remove half the sample. It then changes the mean to here. So relative to that, there are a huge number of outliers. You record all of those. You then drop those and you put in the second half. The second half picks up the break. We don't actually do exactly this, but it works well here, but that wouldn't work in general. Records all of those. Now you put them all in. You don't need all of these when it selects, and so it just says the second half is kept. Nonlinearity poses an extra set of problems I'm not going to talk about. So the approach is not a theoretic. I keep getting accused of me a data miner who never takes account of economics. That's just total rubbish. The approach allows you to embed everything you know about your theory, whether it be a DSGE or a Keynesian model or any other kind, inside a framework that allows you to get a sensible answer by doing econometrics properly, rather than doing a half-baked, I know the truth, I'm going to force the data, torture it, till it agrees with what I pre-believed. And that's why there's been this illusion of econometrics. It's never been allowed a chance to say what the data tell you. Economists have always forced their models onto the evidence. So now we can handle these enormously more complicated models really gigantic, the biggest we've ever done is 5,000 variables on 250 data points for a very large American insurance company that is still in existence. <laughs> and they are doing very well, I can tell you, and they're very avid users of these methods. So the theory can be kept exactly, it can be kept partially, it can be kept plus other variables, it can be not kept at all. It's a win-win situation. If you're right, it'll tell you you're right. If you're wrong, it will at least give you something to work with. So here's a classic example. We've taken a Monte Carlo experiment done by other investigators. So we haven't designed this, Hoover and Perez. They've used a US macroeconomic database, and they've generated a set of variables of which I've taken two, their Y7 and their Y8, as a function of other data, real US macro data. And they had 37 irrelevant and three relevant. And I'm going to toss in an extra 104 irrelevant variables, which is going to make it larger than their sample size. So what they found was that they could discover the right answer in experiment 7, 25%, and experiment 8, 78%. Stepwise to 72 and 22, and at 1%, which is what the one day report, we would get 68 and 69. But if we go to the 141 irrelevant variables and three relevant when T is 139, and we simulate this a thousand times, but we use the appropriate 0.1%, we get the answer 83% of the time and 90% of the time exactly correctly in this hidden morass. So it works. We can also test for parameter and variance, but I'm going to go to the conclusions before the chairperson starts shouting. We can automatically create these models. You don't have to do it. We create the dummies, the lags, the nonlinear functions. You put them all in. It will cost you almost nothing to put them in if they don't matter, and it will save you an arm and a leg if they do matter. So it's a win-win situation. You can embed your theory in the center to be retained under all circumstances, but it might come out insignificant, wrong signed, and not there really, and other things matter. Or it may come back and say, you're a genius, go collect your Nobel Prize. You've thought of the right answer before you started. But you don't need to do that anymore. You can let the computer take the strain. 
There's little difficulty in eliminating all the irrelevant variables, and there's almost the same power. So the way I express it is, if there is a local data generation process out there that you are trying to capture by your set of variables, if you knew it when you started and you just fitted it, but you conducted conventional inference, or if you took our program and embedded it in a vastly larger structure and searched for it, then you will keep almost all the variables you would have kept if you'd known the right answer, cost you nearly nothing to do the searching. You might keep the odd irrelevant variable depending on the critical value you chose, but if you didn't have the right answer at the start, we might still deliver it at the end and you will never discover you've got the wrong answer. There are huge costs to underspecified models and I think the financial crisis is partly due to central banks having very badly underspecified models in their repertoire. And there's a set of references of some of the work we've done. Thank you. A brief question? Yes. What do you mean by that, Paul? That yes, well, for, first, yeah. First of all, one has to put in the economics, as I said. You can't just put in the whole national accounts, although it would be an interesting experiment to try that. But the first thing you need to put in are the national accounts to get the correct numbers, because the program can also be used to correct the data, as we've shown in several recent papers, advising the ONS on how they can get much better flash estimates of GDP using exactly the same methods to use the data that's coming in during the process to improve the quality. Because again, their methods break down when the economy shifts, simply because they're not dealing with such shifts. And the recent publication of the National Institute's flash estimate, I think they've adopted some of our methods and will be more accurate than the ONS's own estimates. And on the second part of your question, I did this for Ofcom. They were trying to model a subset of the economy, namely everything to do with TV advertising expenditure, audience reach, uh, price of TV, construction of non-terrestrial channels, there were about 20 things involved. We put it all in and over the weekend we built a complete system for them of 20 equations which was eventually used for pricing TV licenses because it dominated every other, body, every other model they've been looking at by light years. <laughs>